Hi, everybody. Hope everyone made it in from the waiting room. Uh, good evening. It's been a while since we've been on a call together. Um, apologies for the, the sort of lateness, tardiness of this club. As you know, we were in uh, Greece doing some firsthand exploration of the ancient world and its wines. And um, so this one got out a little bit late, but uh, we're very excited about this topic uh, of beasts and berries, crossings in myth and wine. And um, we're going to talk a little bit be before each section about each of the beasts that we picked out for this um, for this topic. And of course, we'll do the usual. We'll we'll go through the wines as well. So um, before we kind of jump right into the uh, to the wines and beasts, I wanted to uh, hand it over to Dana, who's actually Dana's phoning in from the from the car. Um, some serious dedication here. Uh, yeah. Not even back from one job and he's on to his on to his other job. <laughs> Um, but we're going to have him speak a little bit about the idea of um, crossings and hybridity um, and myth. And then he's going to pass it over to um, to Ryan, who's going to look at that, just that kind of general idea a little bit from the wine side. So uh, without further ado, it's Dana from the I-80 or wherever he is. Actually, good call, Jeff. Yeah, I am coming down the I-80. Hi, okay. everybody. And good, good, good evening. I uh, wish I could be there in person. And I uh, wish I could be sipping these delicious wines with you tonight. They're waiting for me at home. But... I am coming in from the field. So uh, some of you had the opportunity to be in the field as well. So uh, with uh, with these other three gentlemen, uh, we're looking forward to our future Greece trips and also others out into Georgia and farther afield. So uh, I know you'll bear with me as I kind of make my way home in the California traffic. So, um, yeah, but this was a fantastic, fantastic topic. One that, you know, all of us had been playing with for some time. Uh, so you all know, Jeff and I, uh, back in our early days, cut our teeth teaching Greek mythology together and uh, really grappling with some of these concepts of, of, of hybridity. Um, and we're going to get into, again, as Jeff said, you know, the individual examples that we've tied uh, into, uh, you know, but both in terms of what we picked from uh, hybrid creatures and then also hybrid wines. Um, but, you know, I mean, when we look at traditions, when we look at mythology and we look at art history, this, this process of hybridity um, is, is really, you know, it's something that we see across the board. It's something I think that we can really say is, is a fundamental and intrinsic nature and fascination of, of our species. Um, we think categorically in our, in our uh, way of organizing the world. That shows up in the stories that we tell ourselves, the paintings we paint, the uh, depictions of, of the world and our understanding. And so, you know, we, we're fascinated I think by things that cross the boundaries. That's why we see things like taboos and fears against things like snakes, which crawl on the ground, uh, but don't have legs. Pigs with cloven hooves, right? We can, we can reach across religion. We can reach a, across uh, societies and the entire globe and time and find examples of things that don't fit well within certain categories. And those elicit fascination and sometimes fear and sometimes horror. Um, and sometimes, right, we're the progenitors of those things and we create those hybrids ourselves. So, you know, whether they are early Neolithic, you know, paintings on, on walls or even earlier, right? Some of the earliest Lascaux cave paintings uh, have these compositional scenes, which you can say in, in many ways are, are hybrids. Uh, we're experimenting with concepts and then blending them together. Uh, and this is something that we see, again, right, in uh, pretty much every human civilization, every religion, every story that we have uh, plays with these concepts. And so it's a fundamental and principled thing, and it fits very, very well when we start talking about uh, talking about connections in the ancient world, uh, our modern world, and also, of course, uh, with regards to wine and hybridity, right, uh, bringing these strains together. And, uh, and so the, the concepts, you know, they really were fundamental and, uh, and and married to to one another and um, I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to, to kind of speak a little bit about uh, what hybridity when we talk about hybrid grape varietals and so forth what that means in the wine world so Ryan uh, over to you thanks Dana yeah that was that was a uh, great great intro there and, and like there's so many topics that you uh, and concepts that you know you, you kind of touch on there when it when it comes to myth and that I'm sitting here, you know, kind of like ready to talk about it in wine. And it's always just, it, it was, it was really interesting as we developed this, this club, like how, 
um, you know, this sort of like a like slightly esoteric topic of crossing came together where we we're talking about hybrids, we're talking about crosses, we're talking about also mutations and mutants, things like that as well. And there's so much overlap between the myth and the wine. In, in terms of, uh, you know, as, as, as Dana was mentioning, what purposes these things serve some of it being intentional, some of it being unintentional. Um, so this is something that we we really enjoyed diving into in this club with the concepts of crosses, hybrids, and and then and also to a lesser extent, um, um, mutations as well. So with crosses, just to kind of refresh everybody, and for those who maybe you haven't read, read through all the club yet, crosses really in, um, referring to in wine, where you take uh, two varieties of Vitis vinifera of the same species, and you're cross-pollinating these two varieties to create a new variety. Um, so uh, we'll 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 get a little bit more into this as we're tasting through the wines. Um, but you you can do that with um, uh, you know with white grapes, red grapes, with um, you know various types to create something new. Um, hybrids being something where you take a vitis vinifera um, species and then a another vitis species of of grape, um, for example, like vitis um, vitis uh, labrusca. Uh, which is like a variety that you more like a wild type variety that you get from North America. Um, and then also we have also the concept of mutations where you have a variety that might be typically uh, expressed uh, as a white grape, but then in the, uh, in the vineyard, it may spontaneously mutate and you all of a sudden you have um, a genetic change that creates the creates pigment in the skin. So these are just uh, kind of going through like the three sort of main distinctions in terms of, uh, you know, like morphological and kind of, you know, enological differences here. Those are the, those are the three kind of main concepts that we, that we dove into with this club. But, but again, yeah, the, the, the same, um, you know, mythological intentions or, or, or sometimes lack of intention behind these, 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 uh, these beasts, you know, the, these creatures that that are that are so fun and that that serve such interesting purposes to you know to to represent as like a point of fear or a point or some some sort of like you know meaningful object or symbol, um, we see those same sort of sort of uh, connections in wine where you might have someone who said, okay, I I am going to set out with an intention to create a wine that serves this certain purpose for this certain place or this certain uh, uh, whether it's a wine drinking culture or whether it's a market or whatever it is. And also in some cases you have just, you had stuff that just kind of just sort of showed up into the record. Um, just one, one example being like Cabernet Sauvignon, where it was like, it, we know now that it's a, a crossing of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc, but it wasn't like somebody sat, you know, Mr. Sauvignon sat down and like decided to like try it out and experiment with it at the university. It just sort of shows up in the record over time. So, um, but yeah, so I think that this, this is a, um, you know, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot of fun. It was some, one of those things that kind of came up, I would say sort of, sort of organically. So, you know, not sort of a spot, mix of spon the spontaneous and also the intentional um, as far as topics go. So we can, we can, uh, T, unless you want to, wanted to jump in there, we, we can kind of dive in yeah. to some oh, of the first wines, but yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one of the things is uh, for this club, we wanted to focus more on 20th century, more modern crossings, you know? So um, obviously people talk about like Cabernet Sauvignon, which is, a, as Ryan mentioned, a cross between uh, uh, Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. I mean, we don't know whether that was intentional or not. I mean, uh, people are still uh, studying that, but, you know, when you're farming, I think we talked about this before, where, you know, frost and um, just hail and everything can really destroy your crop. So people are always thinking about, like, how can we adjust, make crosses and make grapes that are more resistant to climate change, more resistant to um diseases diseases past, diseases past etc yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. That, that's, a, that's a great point too. i mean I, and like obviously like just the intentionality behind it. i think we, we can talk a little bit you know more as yeah. we get into some of the some of the wines but um yeah i mean i would say really like the the focus was more on modern crosses but there is um there's definitely records going long long you know long 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 time ago of um you know experimentations with different crosses or i should say with different um uh, breeding, if you will, of yeah. vines um, and trying to make clones like from mother, the mother vine and from from parent material. But but yeah, this kind of 
concept of a crossing wine, I would say, is really uh, popularized yeah. maybe or uh, in in the last 150, 200 yeah. years um, specifically. So yeah, I mean, um, I actually uh, for another job, I actually was at the UC Davis um, uh, winery um, in Napa, and they were actually crossing Riesling and Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, and they were testing it because they believed that, that the cross would be more resistant to um, heat and climate change, yeah. Which, yeah, which, which is really, really interesting. I, I was like, wow, right? really like Riesling and Cabernet Sauvignon, like that, that's like wild, yeah. you know, like, cause the, those two grapes are like very different, right? You know, like you have a tannic Cabernet Sauvignon and you have like a more aromatic, but of course, like, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is, as Brian mentioned, is a is cross cross itself. It cross itself so yeah. 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 So yeah. Anyway, so without without further ado, actually, I, I think we should. Before, oh before yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Out, yeah. I was just kind of thinking as you're talking about, um, has anyone tried crossing something like you know like Syrah and Viognier, like things that you would actually make a blend out of? So you get instead of you know, you can buy like shampoo and conditioner in one bottle instead of <laughs> like the three in one, you can like, you can like brush your teeth and, uh, you know, like shampoo and conditioner. Yeah. I mean, I mean, like, yeah. Like, as far as like a cross. Uh -huh. cross yeah. Um, yeah. I am not familiar with that, like specifically as being like, you know, like, like someone like crossing, like, let's say like Grenache and Syrah or something like that to make a, a, Rhone, a new Rhone variety. I, I'm sure it's been tried. I'm certain. Mm -hmm. But so uh, one of the things like, like what he's saying is like, you know, the University of da uh, California Davis is like, they have a, a big program that's experimenting with things like like this. So this is one of the things is that you, you don't really always know how the how it's going to express itself. You might have like a good idea of like, oh, it totally makes sense. So I'll just cross this with this. And now we have like, you know, like a one plus one equals two kind of thing. And one plus one equals three. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't always work that way. Um, sometimes they have, you know, they, they have a lot of experimentation going on at universities like um, Davis, but also I know, for example, in uh, Minnesota as well, University of Minnesota has a very big, robust grape, a uh, hybrid grape program mm -hmm. where they're doing Vitis vinifera with uh, Vitis labrusca to to come up with more resilient grapes as well. So you definitely, um, you know, the, you, it takes a long time for ex this experimentation to really uh, kind of come to fruition. Where um, no pun intended, where where the uh, the the product is now like a commercial commercially viable product because. You know, if you're making something that someone's going to invest millions and millions of dollars into in a vineyard where you might not know how it's going to uh, react after 10 years and maybe a really bad frost hits it, um, that's something that I think, you know, they're, they're not just kind of, uh, you know, oh, that sounds like a good idea. Let's just let's just plant the whole vineyard. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, that, like we're probably close to some of those, Jeff, where, where it's like, oh, this is, you know, uh, you know, like some, some new kind of like, uh, you know, duh sort of sort of crossing that's going to take off. But um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think United States is probably going to be where that's going to, um, you know, you, you'll see that uh, hit the new plantations probably fastest, but I don't know. I would say Germany and Austria are also kind of at the front, the yeah. forefront there as well, which, I'm, which is uh, a good transition to our first wine. I was just um, going to say, I'm pretty sure to Jeff, to your point that Rombauer has had several unsuccessful attempts at crossing Chardonnay with an oak tree. So uh, we'll, we'll keep our eyes open for that. So sorry, Ryan. Go ahead, Dana. I, I don't have. I have no follow up to that. There's, I, there's. You, you can't follow that act. <laughs> I'm, I'm a new dad. I have to get the dad jokes in. Sorry, everybody. Okay, go for it, Ryan. Apologies. No, no, no. So uh, I would say that it's, it was a good. Uh, it was a. It was a transition there to uh, to uh, what actually is our first ever uh, in the club German wine. Um, so, uh, but uh, which is, uh, it, I'll pass it over to T to introduce us to the. Uh, yeah, yeah and, and, and just to add to Ryan and, uh, you know, I, I know on, uh, you know, just to get nerdy, um, you know, when you actually plant a vine and graph a vine, it actually takes three years before you can actually harvest the fruit and then make wine from it. So as a result, if you think about your you're trying to make a cross you're looking at a probably a six, seven year process before you even know what that wine tastes like, which is yeah. a big risk, you know? Yeah. Uh, but of course you're thinking about the future, et cetera. Um, good, so good uh, yeah, um, just, and just to get to the first wine, 
2021. Uh, we love this wine. Um, it shows Schreiler, It's a cross between Riesling and um, a grape that probably no one has ever heard of it. I had to look it up myself. Uh, Bouquetrebe. Um, and it was crossed in 1916. And the idea behind this was to create a more aromatic grape that uh, was still able to resist frost. So that two, is not planted a lot in Germany. Only 2% of, of German vineyards are planted to Schreilebe. But it's what's really unique about it is there's this like kind of red fruit quality to it. Um, and it's crisp, it's dry, it's mineral. Um, think of a Riesling, but with more red fruit. So, you know, people always ask us about what wines can we pair with, uh, what wines can we pair with, you know, more savory dishes. And I think this is something you could pair with, uh, uh, you know, a light white fish. You can even pair with salmon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, as far as a, a, a style goes, again, like, Re dry Riesling lovers definitely this is in in their wheelhouse in their wheelhouse but like but like T's saying like there's the, the fruit character yeah. is, is something where, where, where they play with it yeah. so I I think you know, Riesling itself is already a pretty versatile yeah. grape and so to take that um that extra element I think that was it Bucket or Bucket yeah, yeah. But whatever it is, it is again like and this is this is a common thing you'll see is also where it's like it's some grape you've never heard of, and some grape that you have heard of. You yeah. know, the, as as a cross. Um, this is this is very common, and I think it goes to show how many um, there there are thousands of grape crossings that are experimented with in some vineyards. So you'll you'll see it where it's like it might be, you know, two or three um, different varieties, like two or three vines, and then it'll switch to another vine and another vine. Um, I, I've been in some of the experimental vineyards mm -hmm. in. Um, at the University of Burgundy in Dijon, and mm -hmm. walk walking through the vineyard, and it's like every two, every second or third vine is tagged as a different variety. Oh, wow. and, they, and and so you when in, I've been there in the fall when they're all ripening, and some of the leaves are like, you know, orangey. They're advanced, and the, and the fruit is like is already been picked, and other yeah. stuff is green. You know, and awesome. it's, it's really interesting because they're 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 experimenting. They want to see where things land within the climate. So again, like you, you might have um, just going back to talking about like you know riesling or this like. Or whatever it is, grape. Um, you know, that's th this has come through. Uh, you know, it was um, uh, came through probably many many trials where this right. was the one that stood out uh, and so and, and became commercially viable and propagated. So um, I think this was the early twenties century. I think the twenties twenties thirty nineteen sixteen. Yeah, yeah nineteen sixteen. Okay, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and um, this is actually biodynamically farms as well. So and on um, on limestone soils. So. Yeah. So you kind of have that kind of crisp minerality that you have from really dry Rieslings, but a little bit of the red fruit. Yeah, I think. Yeah, yeah. Red currant. Yeah, that's what I get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, I think this was uh, this, this particular wine by Katarina Wexler was my first Shoreba that I ever had. Actually, um, introduced to me. I think in oh, I want to say like 2012, 2013, yeah. 14 years ago and then it disappeared from the market for a bit so it was a wine that we were actually really uh really excited to see back in uh imported again and so as soon as we had a chance we're thinking okay well you know how are we going to fit this into uh you know an ancient wines club like you know we're usually doing stuff down from more in the mediterranean yeah. it was very exciting once we we're like oh wait, we can do crossing like sure it's a cross and um, so this is this is our first ever german wine and we we're very very happy to have it um in the in the club selection so it's a it's one of our one of our favorites yep um jeff you want to jump in maybe to a little bit on the uh on the first mythological crossing here yeah so we i mean as these guys are kind of alluding to there were a lot of choices we could have made as far as the wines go uh and the same pertains to the to the to the monsters so or beasts kind of went back and forth between those two terms um because not all of them are bad necessarily um just because you're across doesn't mean you're a bad, a bad um, creature. But um, we, we settled on um, three in particular, probably the first two based on their sort of similar pedigree. Um, so the Chimera, um, spelled both these ways, um, you'll see it both these ways. The Chimera um, is descended from uh, a monster, Echidna, and another monster, Typhon. Um, and so these in and of themselves are essentially hybrid monsters coming from the kind of very, very early days of, of Greek mythology. 
Um, they're they're the offspring. Um, the echidna is the offspring of Tartarus, who's kind of the primordial darkness, and echidna, um, a, as well. And they um, uh, sorry, and and of Gaia, they're um, echidna is a child of of Gaia, Earth, primordial primordial Earth, and um, Tartarus is primordial primordial darkness. Um, and um, so the echidna is uh, half half woman, half serpent. And then the Typhons is sort of horrible monster with uh, a dragon's head and like hundred snakes coming out of its out of its neck. So these sort of um, beasts are are there right from the beginning of of basically creation, right? So darkness and earth. And um, there's a lot of interesting stories about the the chimera. We focused in the club on um, a couple of uh, in particular. One was the story of Bellerophon. So who tames the horse Pegasus and uh, manages to kill um, the chimera. And later on, there's a, there's an interesting example here of hubris, which we, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, I think uh, Dana will get into that a little bit later on. But um, hubris, right, the idea that you're divinely, you're challenging sort of the divine authority of the gods by being too arrogant. So tries Bellerophon later on tries to ride Pegasus up to Mount Olympus and gets shot down. Um, for that. But one of the anecdotes we really, really like with, with this story is, um, uh, by the way, that if you can see the monster there, he, he's a, a head of a lion and the body of a goat and the tail of a snake. So in this representation, the goat is kind of popping out from the middle of the, of the head, which is quite bizarre. Um, and it's a little bit harder to see, but we have a, another pot here on the, on the right as well. And uh, so the story we, we really liked here was the um, focuses on the idea of Xenia, which is this guest host relationship we've we've talked about a lot. And there's a really cool vignette in Homer's Iliad. So those of you who have the write ups, we, we talk about this um, here as well. But um, for those of you who don't. So in book six of the Iliad, um, there's a character named Glaucus who's fighting on the Trojan side of the war and uh, Diomedes fighting on the Greek side, one of the great Greek heroes. And. Diomedes, there's been a lot in the Iliad of, of um, mortals coming up against gods and being destroyed by them because the gods get involved in the battles. And so Diomedes asks Glaucus, he says, hey, I'd like to, you know, get to know you a little bit before um, before we fight so I know you're not a god in disguise. And so he gives this his wonderful uh, kind of digression Homer does with the genealogy. So Glaucus gives him his whole genealogy and he Eventually, um, he says he was descended from Bellerophon and Diomedes stops and he realizes, wait a minute, like one of my ancestors actually hosted Bellerophon back in the day. So these two heroes on opposite sides of the war realize they're they're actually contractually unable to fight with each other um, because Zeus, the, the most powerful of the gods, oversees this idea of hospitality. So it's a really neat idea. So they have to lay down the right. They actually exchange um, armor. And we're told that one of them gets a much better deal um, than the others. Kind of a, I think a bit of a tongue in cheek moment from Homer. So you'll see that in the in the write up. Um, but we had, um, you know, those of us who just got back from Greece um, this year, and and when we were there last year as well, it's it's neat. They have they still have this idea. They call it philoxenia instead of xenia. But the idea that you, um, you know, it's the sort of the the highest of of moral codes is to welcome a stranger, um, and then we of course. We kind of have the opposite now. A lot of, a lot of xenophobia, right? Which is we use that term to mean fear of strangers, but the word um, xenia or or xenos, which is the, the person, um, is actually a guest, host, friend, kind of all of those things incorporated into one. So if I stay in your house um, or you stay in mine, um, then we become xenoi uh, for life and actually beyond life, right? Into into succeeding generations. So it's just a neat story that kind of illustrates that. It doesn't have that much to do with the um, chimera per se, but um, thought it would be neat to share that because it's so central to kind of the idea that we have here of, of sharing, um, you know, sharing, rela forming relationships and sharing friendships over over wine, so. Well, Jeff, Jeff, I would add too that just you and I over our many years of travel have often also been asked that question, are you gods in disguise? I mean, it happens quite regularly. Um, yeah, so, well. Yeah. 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 Or, or are you guys <laughs> not in disguise too once in a while? Yeah. <laughs> well, um, Dana, I was going to say, I was thinking about this earlier too, that, um, you know, there's the Jerry Seinfeld show, uh, what was it? Comedians in cars getting coffee. I was like, we need to have a, 
archaeologist phoning in um discussing wine you could do a podcast um or a something like that uh, uh, exactly ancient, ancient historians in cars discussing wine or something like that but not drinking the wine let's not make it very clear it. for the lawyers for for the awg legal team that we're not drinking the wines but we are we are driving and discussing the wine uh, yeah absolutely i love it let's do it right. but we are doing it <laughs> um cool so while you enjoy that one um or while you finish enjoying that one i'll flip the slide here to uh wine number two which i Certainly. i'm just going to discuss this one Yep, I can jump in here. So wine number two, 2021, Birgit und Katrin Fneisel. This is a wine called Zweigler that they make. Um, and this is from Austria, from the Bergenland. And uh, this is 100% Zweigelt. So the grape here we chose, um, it is a cross as well. Um, and this is a cross of two grapes, probably, um, well, one of them probably the most, well, maybe now competing with Zweigelt, but probably the most important red grape of Austria, which is Blaufrankisch also known in Hungary as Kek Frankos. Um, you see it as a bunch of other names in Central Europe as well. And so Blaufrankisch crossed with a grape called Zankt Laurent. I think I, I think I wrote it as Saint Laurent, but you'll see it as Saint Laurent or as Zankt Laurent in um, uh, in French or in, or in uh, German as well. But um, yeah, so the, the these two grapes cross to make Zweigelt, uh, which also means uh, two, like two gold or like mm -hmm. double, like yeah. two gold. But I, I don't think that was actually the, the intentional, mm -hmm. even though it's like, they're kind of like the two like gold star red yeah. grapes, if you will, like of, of uh, Austria. I think the per it was, it was uh, the name was um, uh, the, of the person who first did the cross <laughs> in the 1920s was, was Zweigelt. So, um, but again, this is one of those, one of those grapes that, has now become part of the landscape of the Austrian wine um, scene. This is something that, um, that that means that it's it it's suited to the to the climate. It's it it ripens at the right time. Uh, and something that we were talking about like uh, before was that you know frost and you know disease or rot, you know these sort of things in the mm -hmm. vineyard. These are these were especially in the early twentieth century. These were really um, at the forefront of a lot of these grape uh, hybrid and crossing. Um, experiments was, was, you know, they're coming out of the late 1800s, which was the phylloxera epidemic. That was, a, the, the phylloxera was the grape louse that basically destroyed the European wine industry in the late 19th century, saved by ba what's, what was basically, um, you know, um, the American rootstock um, being brought over, hardier rootstock that was resistant to the phylloxera grape louse, um, which literally saved the European wine industry. So again, this is kind of like the the mental landscape of you have a lot of these enologists and and, and viticulturalists um, in early 20th century who are thinking, okay, we just had this horrible thing that literally decimated the entire industry. We need to, we need to build resilience um, it through creating new varieties, things that are not going to get wiped out by, you know, mm. one bad frost in April or one, you know, bad rain in September or whatever. And so that, that there was a lot of activity about experimentation with new varieties in, I would say, 1910s, 20s, 30s, um, but there was a lot. And then I would say there's a little bit of a pause mm -hmm. um, with the, with during the war and then post-war that kind of like mass commercialization mm -hmm. of chemicals and of like industrial farming really kind of hit because they needed more volume. And then it's as it in the, starting the 60s, 70s, 80s, kind of began to gain steam again. You started to see more of these crosses coming out um, again. So just a little bit of the kind of like trajectory of that in, especially in Central Europe there. Um, but back to the wine, this is um, a wine made by two sisters um, and the, the crossing, um, uh, theme continues here, where this is actually a wine that's made by a, a family that was right on the edge um, of Austria and Hungary. Um, and so this is actually like a kind of like a Hungarian, like culturally Hungarian mm -hmm. wine made from Austria. So you have kind of the crossing of these two cultures and, and it's, it's a cross border wine as well. I believe it's made in at, at their winery in Hungary, if I remember correctly, but the grapes are all from their Austrian properties. So kind of a fun little connection there as well, kind of. Um, for that wine but uh it's a, it's in a one liter bottle it is like juicy peppery fun bright very classic wine for you know for uh austrian um uh you know the like you know the wine yeah. wine garden kind of thing where yeah. you're sitting out in the summer kind of thing it's it, yeah. it's really designed with with this kind of um you know abundance in, uh, of of wine like you know you're you're gonna stylistically i would say it's it's a wine that when you when you crack it open 
it's uh it's probably gonna get emptied yeah uh, which, <laughs> which i would say is the sort of the style it's very yeah. moorish so. i mean it, it's I, I i love this wine um um so i yell it's you know a lot of people compare it to pinot noir um it kind of has that kind of like that red fruit like cherry like kind of smooth um i think there's a little bit of more like texture to this mm -hmm. like a little bit more earth but it comes in a one liter bottle there's a crown cap on it so it's um a screw cap a screw cap pardon me you know and so it's uh you know it's meant to you know have fun you know like yeah. this is what you bring to your springtime barbecue yeah and this is actually a wine that yeah. was I, I mean mm -hmm. not that they don't make wines like this for uh locally and and you know and and work with them there but um i believe this wine and then it's sibling wine um Blau, which is blaufranker this is weigler yeah. but yeah. blaufranker is the other one uh, which is the blaufrankish version of this wine they were kind of um i would say s s spurred on to the market by the importer um originally and to basically say hey hey this this is actually like a pretty cool wine for for the american market for the you know for the export market but um it's something that apparently now does really well for them uh domestically as well mm -hmm. um so i mean i think i think you know zweigel can make very serious wines and so can blau frankish you can mm -hmm. make these wines that have a lot of grip and they're very complex mm -hmm. they need to age they've been aged in oak this is this is a wine again that's like it's it's fun it's fresh it's easy it's inexpensive it's like something that you you can you can feel pretty good about cracking open on well pretty much any weeknight <laughs> yeah so yeah definitely something that again like speaking of you know speaking of what what an intention of the cross is mm -hmm. um you know, you had it. You had a Zweigelt that, like I said, can be made into a more serious wine. But it, it's the the purpose of that grape. I think mm -hmm. is still kind of being figured out in Austria. Um, I'm seeing more of kind of. Uh, I've seen I've seen some like like uh, pet nat like some like, like lightly sparkling wines made with Zweigelt. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen people make a lot of rosés with Zweigelt. But then you, then you see wines again that are that are like destined for the cellar they're like again really like complex and grippy and tannic and have a lot of structure as well so um it's it's um you know the, the grape is only 102 years old mm -hmm. um so it's it's actually relatively relatively new on the scene so again this is something i talk about a lot and, and when we do these tastings is is you know some some places they've had a long long time to develop their terroir or their or their relationship mm -hmm. to a grape or certain vineyards and other places like i like for example here in california it's quite new uh relatively to the you know uh, to mm -hmm. let's say like the oldest parts of you know right. italy or greece or france or whatever so um it's it's exciting to have this development of mm -hmm. saying who knows where Zweigelt's going to be in 50 years in relation mm -hmm. to the austrian wine market i have a pretty good idea where like burgundy is going to be yeah. like champagne like i'm pretty you know yeah they're probably not going to rip up all their pinot noir and chardonnay yeah. but in somewhere like austria like they're still figuring out a little bit you know where where they're um where they're gonna go with with grapes like this and that's really exciting yeah, you know because that, that that's the whole uh be, behind hybrids you know like, exactly yeah 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 i mean like, exactly and we'll, yeah. we can get a little more into the hybrid i maybe yeah. after on the next one but yeah. um the, like the american hybrid yeah. relationship but yeah. um but yeah so we can kick that back over to you there um and jeff and dana on the uh on the on the sphinx here yeah so probably i i don't i don't no, for sure, but I'm guessing that among our audience, this is the most um the most recognizable of the beasts that we looked at this um with this club, the Sphinx, of course. Um, the iconic image on the right. Um, well, not the image is iconic, but the that particular one, but the the beast in question. Um, here you have the the Egyptian version of this very ancient um monster and its and its associated myths. Um, which is it's a little hard to see from the front angle here but is a half person, half human and half lion. Um, it, it's, you know, it's a sandstone um, sculpture, just basically carved right out of the desert. And um, it's it's really interesting. So the, the version that, um, the name we have, Sphinx is actually a Greek word, probably sounds Greek um, to those of you who know a little bit of Greek. Um, and it was applied to this monument. The Greeks, of course, visited um, ancient Egypt, which to, them, which to them, by the time the Greeks became a, um, sort of a flourishing civilization was already several thousand years old, which is kind of incredible to think about um, these monuments. So this this Sphinx here is sometime in the middle of the third um, millennium BCE. Dana can correct me if I'm wrong on that. But and then um, 
yeah, so the name got applied, but we don't know actually what the Egyptians themselves called this particular uh, monument or this particular beast. Um, the one on the left here is is known as the Sphinx of Naxos. Actually, we took we took this picture uh, a few weeks ago in the museum at Delphi. So th this was dedicated by the people of the island of Naxos in uh, around 560 BCE. And you can see, um, or you would be able to see better, I should have, I was looking for a sort of a narrower picture. I should have chosen a side angle there of the of the Sphinx, but you can you can see on the one, you can see on the left that there are bird's wings on this one. Um, so that's a Greek addition to the to the Egyptian uh, model. Whether or not they borrowed the myth directly from the Greeks uh, from the Egyptians, we don't we don't know exactly how that how that played out. But we do know this is the more traditional Greek uh, version on the left and the more traditional Egyptian version on the right, which you see by the way. Um, quite ubiquitously. It's not just in this giant version here. Um, and this uh, monument here on the left was, was of course, dedicated at Delphi, which, um, as you probably know, was the site of the most famous oracle in antiquity. So people would come from all over Egypt and elsewhere and all over the Greek and Roman world, etc., all the way up into late antiquity um, to receive news about the future. Uh, and one of the most famous oracles, of course, was that of um, that was given to King Laius and his wife Jocasta, uh, the king and queen of Thebes. And so they went there and they received uh, the oracle that a son born to them would marry his mother and kill his father. Um, not in that order, but that was the, that was a prophecy. So he was the, the, the parents understandably concerned um, when a son was born to them, exposed him on the mountain. And um, as always happens in Greek myth, right? You can't escape your fate. So um, he was picked up and given to another family and eventually wound up um, at the royal court in Corinth. And later on, when he uh, when he learned of this this prophecy, this oracle, of course, his immediate instinct was to get as far away from his parents as he could, um, where he was in Corinth, not knowing that they weren't his real parents. So he went along the road and, and had what we refer to, I think, in the write up as um, maybe the most famous road rage. Uh, incident of the ancient world where he had a collision at a, at an intersection of of three roads and uh, and killed the the guy who was involved on the other side who just so happened to be um, unknown to, unbeknownst to to him at the point at this point um, was his father. So um, this man, of course, is Oedipus, and he um, la later on he's he's sort of making his way from there to get a, you know farther away from Corinth, um, having no idea what he, what he had done. And he crosses a, a mountain where the Sphinx is, is holding court, the ancient um, beast, the Sphinx, who asks every traveler a riddle. And if they don't get it right, they get hurled down the cliff. So you, you probably have heard this story before, but the famous riddle of uh, what, you know, what creature walks on four legs in the morning, two legs in the afternoon and three legs in the evening. Of course, um, it's man. Uh, per people and Oedipus answers the question correctly and then Sphinx sort of enraged um, this kind of we I think uh, we get into a little bit this idea of sort of intellectual hubris um, no one can ever solve my riddle uh, the Sphinx um, jumps to, to its death and then Oedipus carries on and then he's a hero for saving the population uh, the local population there of Thebes from the ravages of the Sphinx and is uh, made king, marries his mother. Um, and then there's a whole story that goes on beyond this, actually quite an extensive myth cycle, which I'm sure we'll actually have the opportunity, to, hopefully to delve in to at some point, um, some of the, the sort of knock of this uh, of this very, very interesting myth, but gives you a little bit of an idea of the Sphinx. And um, just kind of a side note, the Sphinx is actually a child of the same echidna we mentioned before and her own um, offspring, Orthus, who was the, I think he was the hound dog of Geryon, who was uh, um, uh, the the cattle of Geryon's, one of the myths of um, of Heracles. So these, these myths all kind of come, they circle back and inter intertwine with each other, which is one of the most um, fascinating, fun things about um, getting excited about them. So with that, I will... Jeff, I actually I had a question. Oh, yeah, you yeah, you asked me a question, so I got one for you. All right. Um, I, I I never asked this question before. But so on the the Naxian Sphinx, there she's got br her braided hair. Mm -hmm. Is it? And then uh, obviously, like the 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 Sphinx, the Egyptian Sphinx, you know, has has different uh, kind of like you know accoutrements, if you will. Oh, is that was that 
common to like always have like whatever was kind of local trendy hairstyle at the time like for other sphinxes do we see that anywhere else um and this is also open to dana as well but do we see that like uh, you know local um like like jewelry headpieces all that sort of stuff i, I imagine like the, the naxian sphinx is probably she's probably dressed like someone from naxos you know maybe high you know uh, like high high class kind of look or as anything like that well, just superficially, I mean, Dana, Dana can weigh in as well. He can't see mm -hmm. the images, I don't think. But um, well, I I mean, the image on the right is a very stereotypical kind of straight on um, symmetrical image with the with the headdress there, Egyptian headdress. I'm sure you've seen that image, just anything you see of King Tut, right? That's standard. That's very standard. Um, and then the the one on the left is looks a lot like the sort of Kuroi, um, right? Those marble um, statues in the, in the Kore. Um, the boys and the girls that we saw right on our trip with that um, just yeah the appearance the head the headdress everything like that so I, I guess I don't know if you're answering your question but these particular examples would would very much be recognizable and aligned with the with the kind of local art in that in the respective periods yeah so um, like this, the Sphinx art being much more like traditional and I mean not traditional so conservative in the sense that it didn't evolve right the style is is more or less sort of the same for thousands of years mm -hmm. um and the greek as we saw in, in our visit to the museum i mean over a really pretty rapidly right over a period of a couple hundred years it completely goes from a sort of static stationary um figure to this very dynamic um you know especially when we get into the into the classical and then hellenistic period these like extremely um you know m motion um figures that completely seem like they're moving right so yeah Dana, uh, yeah, that's to add yeah. That? yeah no i think i think it's a really good question and yeah certainly when we're talking about we'll get into this a little bit with uh, the final example too when we talk about uh, ryan as you were talking about the purposes that some of these icons and the the purposes of these this hybridity that's happening um you know certainly it can be deployed for for power in the case of the egyptian sphinx the Egyptian Sphinx is a, yeah, and you were totally spot on with the dates, Jeff. Fourth Dynasty, um, Egypt, uh, contemporary with the funerary complex of Menkaure, which looks like it's the biggest pyramid. It's not. It's the central one that still has its outer casing on the top, right? You guys are picturing that in your heads. Well, it's in the back. Okay, it's in the picture. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's a Uraeus head, headdress, right? Which is uh, one of the, the principal images of iconography uh, for kingship. And uh, there's a lot of a lot of debate about the Sphinx. There's a lot of uh, folks. If you, if you you get into the uh, ancient aliens people, we, we like to call them pyramidiots. By the way, you can you can totally take that and, and apply it. Um, the folks that want to say, oh yeah, the Sphinx is you know it's ten thousand or it's it's you know fifty thousand years old, and we've done tests on the stone. Well, yeah, it's it's carved out of a natural sandstone outcrop, right? As Jeff was saying. Um, but. Um, uh, yeah, very much so, Ryan. It's uh, I'm trying to think of other examples of sphinxes just off the top of my head. I will. Well, they line. Really they line a lot of those. I know in the Hellenistic period, they line a lot of the entryways of lions. I think mm -hmm. are they only lions, or do they have sphinxes in those too? I can't remember. Yeah, they they are. There are definitely later 18th dynasty examples yeah, of sphinxes that become smaller, and they're lining sacred processional ways in places like yeah, Luxor. I think that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, so they're definitely long, and there are Hellenistic examples too, as you mentioned, Jeff. Um, some really interesting ones. Uh, getting into like, I think at uh, Como Shikwafa, which is a large uh, Roman era cemetery, um, there are examples of even sphinxes, you know, that have been applied and changed. But this goes to what we're we're talking about, right? Like, um, and so so Ryan, they do change, um, and some of these hybrid animals, like um, even the Egyptian gods, like Anubis. Uh, are guarding those Roman tombs. They're just like Roman legionnaires. So, mm. so I think to answer your question, it absolutely does happen. Uh, you are suiting local tastes and local beliefs. Yeah, I just um, I, it was just one of those things that just kind of stood out to me. Also, specifically for like the Sphinx as its purpose, where like oh, they're like, okay, we're making a you know a representation of this um, artistically, aesthetically that incorporates elements of our local culture. Whereas when you look at like, let's say like the chimera or some of these other mythological beasts, like they, they don't have like a local, you know, braided hair or like a little like, you know, like they're, they're, they're 
they're like more monst like monstrous in that sense, but they don't have any vestiges of the local culture. Whereas like the Sphinx or like I think you see in you know maybe some of these other, other monsters that that you know that we've kind of looked at as they're kind of allowed to pick up um, some of these local or be dressed in some like, you know, like these local customs or whether it's gods or whatever. Whereas like some monsters are just straight up monstrous, you know, like they're not allowed, like the chimera, you don't, I don't think we see the chimera depicted with like, you know, wearing any local clothes or jewelry or anything like that. So um, yeah, that was just something that I was just curious about. Like this is, this you know, th this is a, uh, obviously a monster. It kills, you know, kills people, if you will, you know, at least in the, in the myth that, especially that Jeff's referencing, um, but like it's it's still you know monstrous, but yeah, like that 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 permission to allow it to be locally adopted versus like some of the other monsters we encounter in myth being just kind of like fearful figures, if you will. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I love how it's like adapted to you know um, you know the hairstyles and and of of Greek culture at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. No good observation. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can, let's, uh, should we jump on to the, uh, next, next wine here? Mm -hmm. Perfect. I have a fun fact. I have a fun fact. If you want to segue. Um, Absolutely. Mention, Dan, I will take any fun facts that you want to toss our way. Sphinx is a fourth dynasty, as I said, associated with the Valley funerary complex of Ben Kaure. in the fifth dynasty, somebody took it upon themselves and, you know, consider that, right. Um, Egypt at its height in the 18th dynasty, right. Much later in Egyptian history, the Sphinx was already, you know, almost a thousand years old at that point right so um even in antiquity there was antiquity but uh in this in the sixth dynasty a couple hundred years later somebody decided to dig a shaft tomb in the sphinx's butt so when you go to egypt be sure to kind of loop around the back and you'll see an entryway to a shaft tomb that is right where it's supposed to be and i don't know why they wanted to spend eternity in that specific place but um i've been in there and it's interesting so back to you i guess you won't ever get like lost you know you're not in like one of those like valley of the king's tombs that like, got lost for thousands of years like everyone would know where your tomb was he's in the butt this tomb. is true yeah yeah you're maybe it's a rebirth thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome i didn't that's know that. not the best segue to our next delicious wine maybe <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah i don't really know how to like like <laughs> leap off of that one dana like guys uh, uh speaking of butts yeah yeah well, uh, well, 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 well yeah yep, yep, exactly yeah so well well so uh with with no segue uh it's a cl club club wine number three um that was again going back to crosses though so was um 2022 venus scaramucha um this is a grape called plavats mali from dalmatia croatia uh on the uh, paleosuch peninsula so 100 percent Plavats Mali. Plavats Mali it, it, in uh, Croatian means little little blue. So you can kind of guess that the grapes are small, little, tiny looking blueberry looking grapes uh, on the cluster there. Um, and this grape is a, as I mentioned, is a, is a cross. This is a cross of two varieties. One is Chorlionak Kastelanski. If you're looking at the, the, the write up, yes, that's how that's pronounced. And yes, I looked it up because uh, I don't speak Croatian, but it's Chorlionak Kastelanski. And then the other grape is called Dobricic. And so these two varieties uh, obviously are native Croatian varieties, Dalmatian, Dalmatian varieties. Chorlionak Kastelanski is, is well known uh, for one primary reason in that it is one of the parent grapes of Zinfandel. So those of us here in the U.S. are quite familiar with Zinfandel. Zinfandel had this kind of Adriatic origin to uh, where it comes from. The, the parent grapes come go over to Italy. There's a whole bunch of um, kind of, uh, well, there's, a, there's a whole, many generations yeah. of, evo of evolutions, if you will, of, of the parentage of that. And then the vines get brought over to California. I'm totally paraphrasing here and we should definitely um, do like an entire club on some of these like Adriatic imports at some point. But uh, I think we've talked about it actually in the Diocletian yeah. club, maybe our, our wine right. Diocletian. But, Mentioned uh, it, but that's a good idea, yeah. But yeah, so the um, but again, the 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 character of that uh, Trojanite Castellansky grape um, obviously has a little bit of that Zinfandel character. So when we were first tasting this wine, which is again grown in a place that is, I mean, I would say is pretty unlike most you know places in California, maybe some Central Coast, but this is like limestone soils, really steep grade, like thirty to seventy percent grade. Um, the the vineyards are are, are really beautiful. Um, they're really unique. Uh, rocky soil vineyards that um, you should look up the 
uh, the winery, you'll see these really cool pictures of just like this, like white rocky soils that yeah. they, they have these vines planted in, but um, not anything really quite like that in California. But still, when I tasted this wine, I still got this kind of like, I was like, wow, there's a little bit of that, like dry Creek Zinfandel yeah. kind of like Lodi Zin, like in a, in a good way. Um, you get a little of that kind of like dried fruit, kind of like peppery, sappy red fruit, but then it's, but then it's definitely gone on a European vacation, got itself a little bit of culture. Um, it's got a little more structure, a little more complexity, a little bit more earthy, you know, earthy 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 yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, it's definitely going to be when you taste it, it's like the, the tannin, uh, level tannins can be a little bit more mm -hmm. than say your typical central coast, the California, Cal Cal California. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So again, this is something that I think is, um, it, it is a pretty versatile wine. This mm -hmm. is a wine that they often do serve with seafood um so you can have these types of wines with uh um you know like like a kind of tomato plus fish kind of dish like a bula like base like like lo mm -hmm. like lobster base like kind of tomato-y like seafood stew yeah, yeah. exactly mm -hmm. exactly i um i think originally we did um back in the diocletian club we did a recipe mm -hmm. for brudet b-r-u-d-e-t which was like a a croatian like seafood stew um, we can send over the uh, recipe for that again, if you, if you've lost that or didn't have, don't have that right up. Yeah. Um, but that's something that I was thinking of when I was tasting this wine, I was like, yeah, that'd be perfect. Like a tomatoey kind of like oh, yeah. fish too. Anyways, that's, I haven't had dinner yet. So, you know, everything <laughs> sounds good right now, yeah. but the, um, again, the, the, the crossing style here, again, it kind of being in between two worlds, um, mm -hmm. aspect of, of this wine is really also what drew us to it. I mean, it's something that, again, when I, when we first tasted it, I was like, wow, it's like, there's yeah. there's kind of this like new world old world tension between it uh, I, on I, the palate. I think that's what I love about this wine that new world old world tension that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it, it it's definitely um so again like this was um this was a variety that uh you know you see pretty um extensively in in mm -hmm. Croatia um this is and in, I would just say Dalmatia in general like along the Adriatic coast there um the 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 variety is um i don't believe this is was, was this was intentionally created i think this yeah. this is just a variety that they yeah. just eventually discovered you know the parents yeah. the parentage of but it's it's like perfectly suited for for that mm -hmm. um that climate and so um i know that there are people who actually have been have been considering trying Plavats Mali here in California as well. Uh, I don't know quite where those experimental plantations are or are at. I've only just heard kind of like from, uh, you know, from articles and things like that, like, like people are thinking about trying it or there's nurseries that are now offering Plavats Mali vines mm -hmm. um, that are here in California. Um, but um, yeah, so this, again, this is something where like us as a new mm -hmm. wine growing region market here, you know, in, in, in California, like, oh, like 40, 50 years from now, we could be drinking some really, really cool wines mm -hmm. from, from grapes that are very well suited to, to our climate. Uh, I mean, this is something where, you know, for thinking on central coast, somewhere it gets a little bit maritime as um, you know, enough air to kind of uh, blow away some of that moisture because because uh, it's it's relatively dry on that on that um, Adriatic coast there of of Croatia they don't get a huge amount of like um, I mean they get obviously rain but they, they don't get a huge amount of like humidity that lingers so in Zinfandel at least I know this from Zinfandel mm -hmm. does not like that um, it mm -hmm. resonates and it rots um, really mm -hmm. readily um, so again this is something where it works well in mm -hmm. drier areas but anyways this is just kind of like my my um, you know vision for the future is that th these wines that are um, you know that are crosses I mean, this could be cross again with something else right. you know this could be this could be the base for something really really interesting as well and what can we learn from it I think you know we have we have this kind of present present you know mm -hmm. in the moment experience right. of this I mean, it's not a, not a hybrid but of this crossing. Um, but there's, uh, you know, and this came up again more organically, but we can make decisions about what to do with these things now. Um, and so really the last hundred years has been this kind of new golden age for wine grape production where it's not this like fixed, <clears throat> this fixed, you know, uh, um, set, if you will, of grapes that you have to work with. Uh, we can really, well, obviously, with with understanding of you know genetics and things like that, we can really kind of pick and choose based on climate change, based on disease pressure, based on understanding soil types and things like that. So, um, one thing I wanted to touch on just before we 
um, talk about the next um, the next mythological crossing was on hybrid varieties. We didn't really get a chance to talk about this much. Um, so none of these wines are technically hybrid varieties, which, as I mentioned before, is a, um, a crossing of two species. You have Vitis vinifera and Vitis labrusca or, or some of the other Vitis um, uh, species. Uh, so that is also something that here in the United States, we're really pioneering. Um, like I mentioned, you, you know, UC Davis, but also UC, um, uh, University of, in Minnesota as well, um, where you have vines that they uh, they start to flower maybe a little bit later. So maybe like later in April, later in spring to avoid damage by frost, or they might ripen a little bit earlier to avoid getting either late summer or early, uh, let's say late, late summer, early fall rains that might impact the, the, the harvest quality or, or even frost or snow. So um, this is something that I would say in the last 30, 40, 50 years, a lot of the hybrid wines have gotten pretty uh, negative reception from the fine wine community. Mm -hmm. And this is something that is really changing. I would say even in the last five years where you're starting to see some of these grapes get recognition for quality um for you know winning winning awards and right. you know big blind tastings and things like that showing up on wine lists in prestigious restaurants whereas you would never have seen like let's say 10 20 years ago like a, a marquette or a save out long or some of these varieties like frontenac like that that are again they're hybrid varieties you would never have seen them on like a prestigious wine list. They're starting to show up now. And from places like Vermont, Virginia, uh, you know, Kansas, Michigan, New Jersey. Canada. I actually, I actually tasted some yeah, good wines from New Jersey. Fantastic wines. And they're yeah. completely valid and worthy of, of, of recognition. And I yeah. think it's crazy that they, they weren't getting a, a, a fair look uh, for, for de decades now. So again, there were wines that I would say weren't necessarily very well made. Mm -hmm. which is part of the learning process and that happens anywhere but um it's great to see i mean places like southern southern england mm -hmm. uh places like scandinavia um mm -hmm. i was just in the, in the netherlands actually um after our greece trip and i tried a dutch wine mm -hmm. and it was not bad i mean i'm yeah. not i'm not i'm not about to go put it in the club but it was not bad and it was you know it was a hybrid variety <laughs> and so um i'm i'm very optimistic and my my drum that I'll keep beating is that we're in the golden age of wine now. So you know these crosses really represent um, this this push forward. You know we understand wine better than ever. ever. And, and and it's exciting because this is like where um, California wine is going, and just you know it's American, it, wine. American wine. Yeah, you know like it's going as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. Ryan, Ryan, chronologically, by the time we get to that topic, topical area, the Dutch wines will be ready for us, you know, maybe exactly. about 30 you know, years from now. Yeah. So yeah, you, either it, that it, or with climate change, it's going to be in the wines of Atlantis Club, uh, <laughs> sea level rising sauce. So. so in the, uh, you know, the 16, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, you know, and in the 20th century, it was the, the English who were spending huge amounts of money to invest in the wine industries of Europe. So you have like huge, you know, huge mm -hmm. amounts of, of money and generations of families in, in let's say Portugal, um, oh, you have Dutch and yeah. English families who all went down there and you have a lot of English who went to, um, you know, went to uh, Southern France and places like this. Now you're starting to see the reverse. You're yeah. seeing them go to Southern England. You're seeing a huge amount of, of international money going into, you know, into, you know, Kent and Cornwall yeah. for the- well, for champagne. Year. For making sparkling wine, sparkling you know, wine. for making, yeah. uh, for making, and, and also yeah. not, not even just sparkling wine. You're seeing still wines. There's one, there's a very good wine being made in Wales. Uh, there's absolutely like you know, yeah, Pinot Noir in, in Wales. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, exactly. you know, this is something that we're going to see more and more of. Yeah. Um, it, it's just something that's, that's coming. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting times, I would say in, in the best of ways, in the optimistic ways, Yeah, but not on the climate change side of things, but I just mean like in terms yeah. of the wine side of things. <laughs> so, so without further ado, I think let's, we, we should jump to the next mythological crossing here, the, the final myth mythological crossing here. I'll pass it over to uh, Dana. Awesome. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, finally home. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome. Uh, live streaming from Dana's garage. The baby's asleep. So I've been banished here, but I'll be uh, sipping along with you. And we can we can kind of round this out with our last creature. Uh, so the griffin. Uh, the griffin is a really fascinating creature. And I want to pick up on something that Ryan said earlier. You know, when we're picking apart these beasts and these hybrids. 
Um, I think one thing, you know, when we compare it to the Sphinx, right, because we think of the Sphinx having a human head and the body of a lion. In this case, right, very similar creature. A griffin has the head and wings and front talons of an eagle um, and the body of a lion, right? So very similar in their execution, uh, but very different in terms of their mythology. And I think a lot of that has to do with... Um, you know, not having a human head, right? So so when we're drawing these distinctions between, say, like, you know, the centaurs, or we're talking about um, the Sphinx, or we're talking about even the Assyrian Lamathu, right, that we've talked about in other clubs, right? Um, these are creatures that have mythologies associated with them where they can be reasoned with, um, but, but, you know, even if that reasoning is somewhat twisted. In the gates of a griffin, um, the mythology is very sparse, and I think that's why we actually see it show up um, mostly in like travelers' accounts in uh, the Greek and Roman world. Herodotus was said, you know, secondhand accounts of encountering it uh, in the Asian steppe plateau where it was said to guard gold. Um, but very, very little is said about the griffin in terms of its mythology. Um, however, in terms of its art historical connections and its um, its legacy, uh, there's quite a bit to be said. Um, I think it's interesting. One thing to note when we see, you know, the the, the emergence of these hybrid beasts and animals, um, oftentimes it's in conjunction with the establishment of new political ideas, the establishment of new cities. Um, and, and this is true, you know, say in the Neo-Assyrian Empire, we talked about the Lamassu. Uh, those are hybrid creatures that emerge when the Assyrian Empire is trying to figure out what exactly it is. It's inherited all of this, you know, um, essentially the Bronze Age to the Iron Age. And in figuring themselves out, they're playing with these ideas and it shows up in their art. Similarly, let's go all the way back to 3100 BCE. Um, before Egypt was even unified, we had, you know, Upper Egypt, which ironically is in the south, and Lower Egypt, which is ironically in the north, has to do with the fact that the, the Nile flows from the south to the north, as you all know. Um, these were two gnomes that that basically, well, there were a series of gnomes, but uh, they were under independent control, and they um, essentially were, were co in competition with one another. And around 3100 BCE, uh, Narmer, who some of you guys might have heard of, this first pre-dynastic uh, king, he's actually Dynasty Zero, unifies Egypt for the first time. Um, and what we see at this time is all these crazy ideas um, that are being played out. It's actually the only time in Egyptian history where we have evidence of human sacrifice, which is taking place in the pre-dynastic period. Um, and we also have these wild hybrid creatures that are showing up, these weird serpopod things that have connections all the way over in Susa and to the east in India, even um, connections through the Red Sea that are happening to, you know, upper Egypt and places like Hierakonpolis. Uh, and it's at this time that we actually see the emergence of the griffin. And it's really clearly depicted on one of these slate pallets uh, from Hierakonpolis around 3100, 3200. It's a little bit before uh, BCE. Um, and from there, it, it actually kind of continues. Um, it it doesn't have a huge legacy throughout Egypt, but shows up again in the late Bronze Age. And uh, it's very interesting the way it's deployed there. Uh, we fast forward to about 1600 BCE. This is the Egyptian 18th and 19th dynasties. So when we think about the heyday of Egypt, we're thinking Ramses II, we're thinking Tutankhamun, Akhenaten, all the big names, right? Um, and also what's happening at this time is this fascinating period of international um, diplomacy, uh, because for the first time you have these great kings, there's Egypt in the south to the immediate north up in the Anatolian Peninsula, the Hittite Empire has established itself uh, and they have their own ideology and their big cities like Hattusas. Um, and um, up in Lake Van and that area. To the far east, you've got Mesopotamia, which has been emerging alongside and trading with Egypt, um, but largely up to that point, politically independent um, with these great kings in places uh, like uh, Babylon and also uh, the rise of the early Assyrian Empire. And then to the far west, you've got um, the Mycenaean kingdoms, right, which we talked about a lot. Uh, this is actually the period of time that Homer's writing about in the eighth century, seventh, eighth century BCE. Uh, he's writing about right this 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 time that's about sixteen hundred to twelve hundred BCE. Um, 
And what's happening is these kings are recognizing each other and they're actually communicating with each other. And they're writing to each other using Acadian as a lingua franca. And their courts are keeping these letters. So we have these correspondences of letters written to each other, recognizing these kings. Oh, Totalius III, my great brother, um, you know, wouldn't you, wouldn't it be great if you could send me, you know, a daughter and we could, we could, you know, solidify our, our, our marriage. And, and we see this like bargaining and this trading that takes place. And also, of course, warfare, right? The Hittites and the uh, Egyptians clash at places like Kadesh and so forth. Um, but in addition to this, this period of trade and internationalism and, uh, and warfare, what we also see is the emergence of sort of an elite style. So just like those kings are writing to each other in Akkadian, which is the throwback language, it's kind of like a common language that nobody speaks anymore, almost like how Latin right, was used in, uh, in, in, uh, for, for ages as sort of the language of the intelli intelligentsia. Uh, we also see the emergence of artistic styles that become shared traditions that are associated with the elite. And it's in this setting that the griffin actually makes its reemergence. Uh, the griffin becomes this sort of hybrid animal that's resurrected, and it's not quite Egyptian. It's not quite Hittite. It's something in between. Um, uh, Marion Feldman, uh, one of my advisors, uh, this was her work, and she analogized this international style in the late Bronze Age to similar to how if you look at European banknotes right on the euro, you'll see things like bridges and you'll see Gothic architecture and windows and stuff. Um, none of those things are real. They are all pan-European inventions meant to create a currency, an idea of inclusion. And very similarly, that's what's happening right with the Griffin in the late Bronze Age. So pretty, pretty interesting and important role. Um, and uh, one that has a tremendous legacy, right? The Griffin gets adapted uh, by the Persians and then the Greeks uh, as well. And it's a very interesting thing. Um, when you look at the, the, the bronze work, it typically shows up in bronze work. That has it because it's tied to Assyria and Urartu and these traditions that the Greeks end up adapting and changing. But they're, they're very striking, uh, these images of the griffin with certain attributes. Um, continues into the Persian Empire and then into the uh, late, you know, the, the uh, all, all the way into the Islamic period. And then you have Islamic influence coming through the Moorish occupations. 711 Tariq sweeps into Spain, Andalusia. The Crusades come all the way down to Jerusalem. Um, this, 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 in, in, in these settings, right, the Griffin continued to occupy this sort of hybrid political space and showed up in the heraldry of right like later uh later european uh european kings in fact charlemagne uh, uh prided himself on having what he thought was a um, and this was this was true these these uh griffin talon cups which um, were wine drinking glasses so again here's a connection between uh ancient griffins and wine uh, there were really you know cow horns or water buffalo horns that would be traded but um you can imagine the horn and then Right, it was embellished, uh, and some of these were even kept in, you know, French. Uh, I think I think it was at Chartres, or um, I forget exactly where uh, the the wine, the Griffin wine cup, the Griffin claw wine cup of Charlemagne was kept in France. But um, long legacy and uh, even a small connection to wine. So uh, I'll, I'll leave it at there, and we can we can move on to our final wine of the evening. Thanks, Dana. So I'll talk about the Kerner, which is uh, our special offer wine. Um, I've never uh, been, to, if you've never been to Alto Adige or Sutero, which is what they call, you know, um, is, you know, it's south of uh, Germany in the Italian Alps. And it's such a beautiful area. Like if I could ever go back to another area, Sutero Alto Adige would be my choice. Um, you know, they speak more German than Italian there. And what I love about this Kerner is that it's a, um, because imagine trying to grow grapes in Yosemite, except yeah. it's the Italian Alps. So like there are like spears of like, you know, uh, of mountains that like are like rising up. And so this is uh, from a co-op. Um, and Kerner was a grape that was uh, bred and made in 1929 uh, to uh, a cross between Riesling and Trollinger or Schiava. 
Um, uh, so a white and a, a red grape. And to make a, a wine that would be a grape that would be more aromatic and more uh, resistant to frost. Um, and so Kerner is the result of that. And um, I think it's an incredible grape that you don't see as often in either Germany or Italy. Uh, but in Alto Aldige, it's um, a great grape that you can have, you know, like it's, you know, Ger uh, German, if you ever go to Alto Aldige, like German tourists come down to, to, as, 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 exactly, yeah, to, to try it. And it's, it's an incredible grape. I think it's like, it has arom aromatic qualities. You know, you have like a more of like a lychee kind of like camel meal a uh, note to it mm -hmm. and i think it's but it's crisp and dry yeah, yeah that, that i mean like that that tension but like you said between the there's a red grape which is trollinger yes also not in, in uh, it, that's like i think the, the german variety mm -hmm. then you, uh, you also see it as vernach v-e-r-n-a-t-s-c-h well. -E and then you also see as schiava in 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 italy that's the red grape yeah. all, all three of those names i just mentioned and then it's a riesling yeah. and I think the the red variety in this cross really yeah. gives you get like the, like the more texture, the body. Yeah. Um, it's it's one of those wines that I always recommend people should close your eyes and 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 smell, close your eyes it and drink drink it in the dark if you feel so inclined. I don't know, turn off all the lights, but because it, it really has that experience where you kind of you, you're kind of fooled a little bit. Um, it, you know, it really kind of challenges your perception. I, I I I love Kerner. I think Kerner is one of my. Mm -hmm. If someone asked me what my favorite Italian white variety was, I would probably say Kerner nine out of ten times, yeah. um, depending on what I'm drinking, but yeah. and who I'm, who I'm drinking with. But the uh this again the the style you know it has that that tension between like the red and the white, and so you get like like this like like zippy riesling mm -hmm. like 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 energy with the, yeah, the, a little texture. Bit, the texture texture and the fruit yeah. and yeah. yeah and so like like as, as t mentioned you know alto adige it's it's alpine um but i think you know saying like like yosemite or the, you know kind of sierra nevada yeah, is kind okay. of like a, like a good a good comparison where it, it can get really hot in alto yeah. adige yeah. as well i mean of this course, is this yeah. is a region where they they employ what's known as the the pergola trentino um, in the more in the trentino region of, of alto adige but where they grow things up in a big pergola because I mean, it can get so hot if they had vines down down lower. Like they're gonna, you're, you you can get, you know, especially if you get humidity, mm -hmm. humidity plus heat, like you get rot. And so they they want those breezes to to blow through, even though it can get like really, you can get big wines from up there. You can get wines that get up into like the fourteen point five, like fifteen percent alcohol range, no no problem at all mm -hmm. um, from that region. But you still have those alpine influences. So so there's so many like valleys and things like that. There's microclimates as well. And so growing grapes, they're like, as you mentioned, like this is from a co-op, uh, which that means like that you have a bunch of growers who they're making their wines at a set, you know, like, like a cooperative place. Um, like this was like, the, that was the norm norm up there because, you know, you, you have so many different microclimates, you have so many different valleys, like you have different um, variations in terms of like, oh, this one, this one worked out, that one didn't. So that was just totally the norm up there. And so you actually have, what I would say is probably some of the in uh, some of the best cooperative made wines in the world in Alto Adige, where it's in a lot of other countries, uh, oh, it's made at the co-op. I'd be like, okay, uh, let's, well, 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 we'll give it a shot anyways. But uh, in Italy and specifically in Alto Adige, and also I would say in Piemonte, also just mm -hmm. as an aside, these are two of the regions where if you see a wine that's from a cooperative, uh, cooperative like Barbaresco, for yeah, example. from like uh, Prodotori del Barbaresco is a very famous co yeah. cooperative. These are some of the regions where that is not, you know, a red flag by any means. Some other regions, again, I'm speaking with my like buyer's hat on as like yeah. a wine, you know, having ran a wine retail shop and worked for importer cooperative. Usually, you're like, I don't know, like let's we'll we'll try it. I but mean, I, this so, this wine in particular yeah, like, from, yeah. from the Cantina Valle di Sarco um, is is fantastic and, and and the thing about Alto Adige is like uh, I was lucky enough to visit there and the farmers told me basically you cannot not have a cooperative because of the seasonality because you know like you could have a bad vintage you could have frost etc 
as we mentioned before. And so the only way that you can really survive is through a cooperative. Working together. Working mm-hmm. together. You yeah. cannot not work together yeah. because otherwise you would be putting yourself at a huge amount of weather risk. risk yeah. yeah. And mm-hmm. that's one of the, one of the yeah. I think, reasons why there's actually just not that many kerners on the market. Yeah. Um. I mean, it's exported here. If you go there, sure, you'll find, whole, you know, probably a decent amount of, mm-hmm. of variety. But I would say here, you know, as far as the producers who can afford to commercialize internationally their, their, um, their products from mm-hmm. that region, I mean, I would say is, you know, again, Aswadi J is a region that, you know, wine geeks like us love. There's so <laughs> many fun, interesting wines, interesting grapes up there. Um, but there's probably like 20, yeah. 30 producers maybe yeah. that really make it to the to the US market. Yeah. And of those, I would yeah. say probably a dozen maybe yeah. are really the ones that you'll see on wine lists, the ones that you'll yeah. see in wine shops yeah. um in most, let's say like the western United States, just due to like again, just due to production size. Yeah. Due to and due to you know, capital required to commercialize internationally. Yeah. So it's kind of a special line. Um, it, it's kind of a, a special experience to be able to, to be able to try it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a lot of fun. And also uh, go to Aldo Adiche if you have a chance. It's <laughs> it's amazing. T, T, gets, T gets $10 every time he says that. Yeah, so. I'm going to say. <laughs> He's on the tourism board. Yeah, I'm on the tourism board. Yeah, no. Can you use his affiliate link uh, to book travel? I wish, yeah. <laughs> Actually, uh, as far as uh, regions in Italy, I, I have not been had the chance to go to Italy yet. I've not been, but yeah. Alto Adige is one of those one of those regions where uh, you know on long days when T and I were bored at the wine shop, sometimes we play the game on Google Maps where you just drop the pin, you know, on the Street Map or Street View. I mean, and you just drop a pin and be like, oh, what does it look like in this place? Mm-hmm. And Alto Adige was like one of those places where no matter where I dropped the pin, I was like, whoa. <laughs> that looks really nice. We should. I, I want to go there. You know, it, it, was, it was very idyllic in a lot of ways. And so then, then of course, T went and confirmed you know, yeah. everything that yeah. that we suspected. So yeah, we'll, we'll make. We'll definitely make it over there. Uh, um, I never went to wine region where I'm like, actually, I don't want to taste wine. I would rather take a hike or, <laughs> or go on a bike ride. Like, I'm like, can I please not go to winery? <laughs> well, yeah, you were, you were there for a couple of weeks. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, yeah. we, we've talked about, um, you know, um, maybe some future future in, in, ancient wine uh, wine wine trip so we would maybe consider uh, getting up there because i'm pretty sure we wouldn't be allowed to go to the go to the country without going there now yeah. according to you know according yeah. to you so but yeah so, yeah 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 exactly exactly so um well i think um at this point we can kind of open things up and just thank you to everybody um and for for joining us for the for the club tonight if you want to order any additional quantities of this wines as always you can uh or from this club or past clubs you can just just shoot us an email um or a phone call or a carrier pigeon whatever works best um so we can um we can ship up to nine additional bottles um for um for free to uh to california colorado oregon washington and then five bucks for pretty much everywhere else so um yeah as always thank you so much for joining us um we'll open it up for if there's any questions um you can either unmute yourself or drop a question in the chat and we'll we'll get to you um uh, right away but um, yeah, as always, we just wanted to say thanks for for joining us during this discussion, and we are honored to have all of you with us. So.